Good afternoon, everyone. The Black Alumni Council presents the Life of a Leatherneck podcast. My name is Byron Williams, your host for today. And today's podcast features Mr. Bernard Muhammad. How you doing, Bernard? I'm doing good, Byron. How you doing today? Doing good, doing good. And, uh, you know, Bernard, we've been knowing each other for, what, close to, what, 39 years, 38 years? Yeah, getting, yeah, getting close to uh, about 39 years. We, we met in going 1983. on 40. Let's round up. <laughs> yeah, let's round up. <laughs> uh, so what we want to know is, what have you been doing? Tell me a little about, bit about yourself, what's been going on in your life. Uh, let the uh, Leathernecks know out there what's going on with Bernard. Okay. You know, you know what? Uh, what I've been doing now is... Recently, I made adjustment to what, when we started going through the pandemic. And one of the things uh, adjustments I made was uh, I decided to do me a podcast. Okay. It's just like you're doing a podcast now. And one of the things I did at work is on Mondays, we talked about the Chicago Bears. So in 2020, when we first went to the pandemic, I decided to do a Bears podcast. So that's one of the things I do to occupy my time. And it's been a fun, um, it's been fun doing it. Mm-hmm. We've been going on two years. We we have about uh, 565 subscribers on YouTube, about 600 followers on Facebook. So we're trying to grow that podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, hopefully we have some good news and they start winning one year, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it, it, it makes for a better show. It but does. You know, one other thing Martin, I did not mention is uh, one of my dedications to scholarships that's been uh, I started in 1997 and I was actually inspired by the Million Man March mm-hmm. to uh, go into the scholarship area but unfortunately it, it was motivated by one of our fraternity members who passed away and I yeah. used his death as a way to start my endeavor on scholarship which is the a Roy Shepard scholarship yeah. So I started that in 97 with the assistance of the brothers from Omega Psi Phi Epsilon Beta chapter. And then uh, 2000, we started the Epsilon Beta Memorial Scholarship. And in my grad chapter, I was instrumental in helping us start the Carter G. Woodson Scholarship. And with our foundation, the Epsilon Beta Foundation, I've been, I played a, a part in starting the Epsilon Beta uh, scholarship, which started in 2019. Oh yeah, that's awesome, and uh, definitely we appreciate your dedication because sorting through all those applications, reading them, it takes a uh, complete concentration and dedication to get through everything and award the right recipient. So thank you, thank you for your dedication, uh, Bernard. Hey, thank you, and, and thank you for everybody who participated in any of those fundraisers. And like you mentioned about reading scholarship, I had just thought about the other day. I've been reading scholarship applications since 1997. So that's about almost, what, 30, 30, 25 years yes. for reading uh, scholarship applications. Yeah, and it, definitely the kids definitely need these scholarships today. I know when we went back, when we were in school, you can get a student loan to get through the whole year with that one student loan. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not the case anymore. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I think when we were in school, Weston probably cost, it was less than 5000 a year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, you, you could get through with maybe, I, I think personally myself, I didn't have to take any student loans out during oh, that okay. time. Oh, well, you were blessed then. <laughs> <laughs> or poor. <laughs> uh, right, right. So can you please share your WIU story? You know, there's lots of colleges, lots of universities across the country that you could have attended, but you picked WIU. What what led you to uh, pick Western Illinois University? Okay. Hey, what led me to pick WIU? Let let me go back to high school. Uh, I went to Limbaugh Technical High School, which was a school that prepared you for college. I was an athlete, played football, had no intentions on going to college. But everybody at the school was going to college and one of my best friends, Emerson Bowie, his father, Emerson Bowie Sr., was a recruiter for Weston. And he came to one of our games and he talked to us about college. And that was the first time I even thought about going to college. So in a nutshell, he recruited us to uh, Weston. And that's what uh, how I picked that. I only applied to Weston and Howard uh, University. And my, my plan was, I was gonna get all A's, 
my first year at Western, and I was on transfer to Howard. Okay. I forgot all about that after I graduated because I had so much fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> you say that went out the window. Huh? I'm staying. Yeah, it went, it went out the window. <laughs> right, right. Nothing like Lincoln, Washington. I'll break you in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, but as far as some of my experience, Byron, uh, it, it was a it was a uh, good experience, and it it contributed a lot to my growth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I would like to thank is brothers like yourself who were like my big brothers coming in and not just because i was interested in pledging omega sci-fi yes you were just one of the sincere people on campus that uh, i thought was a real good person and um one other people's that i really the person i'm sorry who i looked up to was mark allen which yeah. uh he's with the ancestor now but uh mark mark was really my big brother okay. as far as mentoring and uh, getting things done and looking out for uh, black people. And I think it, it started in 1984 in the spring semester. There was a, a boycott about the African-American studies program. Mm -hmm. And I was so inspired about, about that demonstration that I went in and um, volunteered my service to help Mark, who was the president at that time, and James Brain, uh, his name is James Anike now, and I went in and asked them, do they need help? And they said, yeah. And I, and I said, what, what do y'all need help in? They said, what's your major? I said, I'm a business major. They said, well, you are a treasurer now. <laughs> so I, I ended up being the treasurer uh -huh. of the Black Student Association uh, the second semester of my sophomore year. And eventually I became the second vice president. Then I became the vice president. And my last year there, I became president of the BSA. And I also worked at the Gwendolyn Brooks Culture Center for about three years with Belinda Carr. So I worked a whole lot with uh, Dr. Rudy Womack, uh, Belinda Carr, uh, Earl Bracey, when he was just one of the attorneys on campus for the students before he became vice president of student affairs. Uh, I was part of the individuals when Mark was pushing that campaign of if uh, a black candidate is not in pool swimming, Nobody swimming. Wow. So, <laughs> so, uh, but like I said, I look up a whole lot to Mark, uh, the courage he showed. And when I think back at it, I'm, I, I really, it, it, it's amazing because I realized he was only probably about 20, 21 years old. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and I guess when you're going through that stuff on campus, you don't really think about that. You really are young people. You know, and some of us are a little bit more it, mature it, than yeah. others, right? Ahead of our time. Yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, uh, I remember you were uh, a host of the Black Awareness Seminars. I remember those back uh, in the 80s. Yeah, yes. Hey, Byron, you bring back a lot of memories. So, yeah, yeah so Byron, what I, I did do on campus, other than just pledging and uh, uh, being at BSA, I tried to create forms for black students to be able to communicate. So we created, me and one of our friends, Sydney Muhammad, we created a, a, a seminars called Black Awareness Seminars. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had that going on for maybe about two years. And one of the interesting things about the Black Awareness Seminar, there was a guy on campus named Anthony Wells. And I had heard he did poetry and I brought Anthony Wells in to do some poetry and show how when you do stuff, how it comes back. So at the graduation in the uh, late 90s, Anthony reached out to me and said, Bernard, I'm running for Alderman in the Fifth Ward. Oh. And he said, uh, I need a campaign manager. I said, man, I'm not into politics, right? <laughs> and he said, man, but you know how to get things done. Yes. And so I said, and he was like, man, you know, when I did that poem back in the day, I was like, you owe me one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I ended up volunteering and ended up being uh, his campaign manager. That was my first time and last time, but it was a very interesting uh, campaign. And we actually ended up running against Leslie Harris, mm -hmm. who's the current alderman now, but she was not the alderman at the time, but she ended up winning at that time. Oh. And um, Tony also is with the ancestors too. Uh, good brother. Okay. Um, and then other things I would say involved, it was so many things I participated in school. Uh, I was part of student orientation board. Uh, they had a movie committee 
that selected the movies that were shown in the union at that time. Because, you know, they only show movies every so often. It's not like now where, you know, uh, uh, students maybe go to the movie theaters, you know, in Macomb. Mm -hmm. They show maybe, I believe, one movie a month or whatever it was or on Wednesday, whatever it was. So I was part of that committee. And also, uh, a lot of people don't know this, who do know me. I actually had a heavy metal show on WIUS. Uh, Byron Thornton had hired me. It was a volunteer when I said hire. And I did a couple of shows. And I ended up on the heavy metal because that was a slot. But I wanted to be on like a slot like Mark Allen, who we call Soda McCone. I'm like, no, I want to get on the night Black people are on. I, I think uh -huh. we were on uh, Friday or Saturday, something like that, and maybe one day during the week. But yeah. they put me in a, on Saturday in the middle of the day playing heavy metal. And when the phone lines went up, I'm like, I don't know what that song was, right? They people call <laughs> last week and I play the song again. I'm like, I don't know. Hey. I'm like, hey, you know, a lot of that stuff then was, uh, it was all pre-recorded. Yeah. And we might have had a list of what we were playing. And music was so much different than probably what they do now because everything was like a, 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 a reel at that time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where I just come in, and Byron was like, hey, I know you don't know this music. Byron probably doesn't even remember that Byron thought uh -huh. yeah. But uh, after about a couple of shows, I was like, Byron, I can't do it, man. I, I got to be on the R&B show. <laughs> right, right. You, that major job means all you had to do was push the play button. Are you ready to go? Right. Right. Yeah. It was the phone calls that was getting me where people was right. like, hey, what was that song? I, I don't know. <laughs> I get back to you, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what? I did not know they show movies in the union. I don't remember seeing one movie in the union. Mm hmm. The years you I was know, a lot of the black students did not go to those movies. Yeah. At that time, you know, a lot of time what we actually did was we rented a movie and we might have had our own movie night because I know at one point we show Cooley High movie a lot. And uh, at least I know we showed the Black History Month. And then we, I remember we had rented the uh, Real to Real because that, all that stuff was on 16 millimeter. Mm -hmm. And I remember us showing it. And uh, I want to say it might have been Tanner or one of those locations where we showed the movies. But the Black students at that time did not go to a lot of those movies. Uh, other than I, I remember like we had Rocky Horror Picture Show that was in the union and you know that's one of those movies where it was one of those participant movies you know where yeah. you throw water and all that so I was part of that committee that we voted to do that uh, bring that movie in also since I was over BSA and worked for the Brooks Center Belinda Carr put me over the River Newsletter and what I tried to do with my administration when I was over the BSA, I, I brought in students who were majoring in certain things. And I can remember Mia McShane, um, she ended up being the editor and I just wrote articles. And uh, I remember Antoine Bracy was my legal defense guy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, his whole purpose was if black students got in trouble on campus, uh, Antoine went to their hearings to make sure that they got a fair trial. Okay. So, yeah, so one of the, cause a lot of students would, you know, if they did something, they didn't know what their rights were. And sometimes they get into those hearings and they were railroaded because they just didn't, they never read the student hand, but you know, we didn't have time for that. So Antoine was majoring in that area. And Antoine personally saved a lot of people. And I had to give a shout out to Am Antoine. He lives in the Philippines now. <laughs> Antoine went to those hearings constantly to uh, help defend black students. And sometimes it backfired on us. I always remember this one guy backfired on us on, and we actually got him out and we uh, he told his lady, he actually did it. <laughs> wow. Guilty. Guilty as charged. Yeah, he was guilty. <laughs> but, uh, he, he was lying to us the whole time, you know, that yeah, he yeah. had not did it. But, you know, it, it is one of those things, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you trust that when people come to you and something happened on campus that they're being true for it. But we did what we were supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah, help defend the young man. Yeah. All right, Bernard. Okay. Is your major still relevant to your career path? If not, what has been the catalyst for your evolution or pivotal change in life? You, you know, it's, 
it had it's relevant now. It was not relevant when I first came out of college. My degree is in business finance, but my my emphasis was on real estate and banking. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't really realize the real estate market of what it, the potentials were at that time. And so I remember my fact, Byron, that we had some classes together. I believe we had real estate principals together. Yes. But you actually could get your license to be a real estate agent through those classes that we had at Western because I had real estate law, uh, real estate appraisal, I had real estate principals, yes. and how the real estate uh, law has become effective today is currently in the area that I work in. Even though I'm a financial analyst, my job, I deal with a whole lot of contracts. So I see a whole lot of loan agreements. I see a whole lot of legal documents and the attorneys at the place I work, they take those documents and once they close, they like, hey, good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I find myself being able to use those skills and also to pull in the rest of some of my real estate background and actually for a while uh, i was actually a mortgage broker for some years and i was a real estate investor uh, i had owned several I, I was invest i used to invest in single family homes yes so i had owned several homes that i was renting out to individuals and i always been in i had always been in business for myself to be honest yes. uh, uh my first business and when i look back at it was i was an independent contractor the lady was selling snowballs on the corner when i was probably nine or ten years old uh -huh. i went and asked her how much would she pay me to sell snow cones whenever she had to go get more stuff that's her children always show up so we negotiated and i can remember she paid me a salary to come uh, cover her snowball stand whenever she left and when i was in high school i cut uh, a lot of the football players hair and when I got to Western, I was cutting a lot of the black guys' hair in the dorm initially started on the floor. And so I had a business, my first business out of college, I had a bookstore for a couple of years. And like I said, I had my real estate business. And currently I have a business now that's successful business. It's been around since 2009. It's called Sister So-and-So. Mm -hmm. It's actually a uh, silk screen and embroidery business where we do a lot of t-shirts. Actually, this is one of the shirts that I did uh, for the business, but I always believe in being an entrepreneur and doing things for yourself and having other streams of income. Now, I know I've ordered several uh, shirts from Sister So-and-So, so, -and -so, so. <laughs> <laughs> yep, they're in my closet. So what was, Thank you. what was your most memorable moment at WIU? Now, I know you have probably a hundred of them at least, but does, does any of them stick out that you would like to share? I'm trying to narrow it down because it is a whole lot, but you know what? One that pops in my mind that Sydney and I talked about a few days ago, so I'll share that story. Uh, you know, it's a lot of stuff that happened in, at a university with us as being young students, uh, young individuals that could lead to uh, railroad and our college experience. And uh, I sacrificed, I really didn't fear nothing at, at the most part. And I, you know, I just believe in helping people who needed help. And I could remember I was, uh, we was having a, you know, after set at uh, the queues were, and you know, the cone police always came to different individuals. These things, to, you know, say the music was too loud. So anyway, this night they grabbed Michael Shaw, one of our frat brothers, and they put him in the back seat. And so I said, hey, Sydney, we can't let them take him in because. He didn't do anything, right? It was just like Mike was not had to open the door, so they just grabbed and put him back in the car. So we talking, and I said, Sydney, we gotta block them from taking Mike. I said, let's lay down. And we laid, people thought it was crazy, mm -hmm. but we laid down in front of the police car. And they got out, like, hey, y'all better move. And then I got up, and that's when I think most of the people came out, actually, when I was talking. So a lot of people only saw Sydney laying on the ground, but actually both of us was laying on the ground, and I actually went, got up and said, hey, I'm the president of the Black Student Association. You're not taking him to jail tonight unless you tell me what is he being charged for. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me almost like, you know, like, do you know who we are? I said, and I was like, 
we're gonna lay down. You just got to run us over. Unless you tell us what he's being charged for, you're not taking him anywhere. And they looked at each other, opened the door, unhandcuffed Mike Shaw, told him he could go. Wow. And that, that's one of the most memorable things because after it happened, I said, man, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but you took, a stand, you took a stand. You took a stand, right? Yeah. Yeah, but that, that to me at the time, when you are in those moments like that, it, it's not about if, if it's fear or those things. It's what is right or wrong. And like I said, later you may go back and say, man, maybe that wasn't smart. I, I don't know. But at that time, I did what I felt we needed to do. And that's probably one of the most memorable moments because Weston had his great moments. And also in the 80s, you had uh, racism happening, you know, on the campus as well, like you do have now. But it still was a great uh, experience. And I do love the fact that I believe I played a part in making other students experience to not have to experience some of those things. And one of the... uh, better moments of of going back to visit for homecoming is when somebody showed me my name was on the wall in the University Union. Wow, that's nice, that's nice. Mm -hmm. As an alumnus of WIU to date, what is your greatest achievement? You know what, I would would say my greatest achievement if I'm talking career-wise, I would say working for myself, even though I still punch a clock for another company, but my greatest achievement is working for myself and starting my own business. As far as in my personal life is having, uh, being married and having four children and watch my children through their experience uh, in college. My oldest daughter is a fashion designer, yeah. have her own clothing line. My uh, next to the oldest daughter, she works for Blue Cross Blue Shield. She also has her own business as well. She does crafting. My son just graduated with an aviation management degree from Southern Illinois University uh, this past weekend. My my youngest daughter, she just finished her freshman year at, at Xavier University in New Orleans. Uh, she finished with a 3.75 GPA. Her, her doctor is to be a uh, neuroscience wow. uh, uh, surgeon. I'm sorry, a neurosurgeon. Mm-hmm. And so I know with having parents that have college degrees it helps to have a role model for your children to say hey uh, my parents did it I could do it too Uh, it took me five years to get my degree I mean that's the thing about it as well when you're involved in that many things on campus it does affect your grades to some degree yeah and my last semester there I was like I'm not doing nothing other than going to class. <laughs> <laughs> so you're punching out of everything else. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's it. I'm not to burn my stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are some of your experiences at WIU that are responsible for your success and why? I know you had a lot of leadership roles, so I, I mm-hmm. imagine that all of those activities that you were a part of uh, helped mold you to be the person you are today. You know, I would say be working with Dr. Rudy Womack and Belinda Carr, uh, they were very instrumental in, in playing leadership role because it kind of helped me kind of redefine how to address things as far as, you know, working within the institution of doing stuff because a lot of times when you you could be totally radical on stuff, but I'm not trying to get kicked out of school either. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think in, in that aspect, they played a role in that. And I can remember right before graduation, uh, Dr. Rudy Womack was like, hey, this campus is going to miss you. And I was like, well, you know what? We left it in capable hands. So that that played a role in uh, being able to put, they, put myself in a leadership role because actually before that, even though in high school I was an athlete, I was more of an introvert, you know, I, I still have my introvert moments, but th- that allowed me at Weston to reach in and show those leadership qualities that I, I really didn't know I had it on that level. Yeah, because I, I remember in, I believe when we were in school, 
Dr. Martin Luther King bill was signed as the legal holiday. And I, I could remember being in a class and a professor said, we wouldn't have class Monday. And he said, because there's a holiday for this guy, whoever he is. And I'm like, what do you mean? Whoever he is. And ironically, we had some workshops with the SGA that weekend. And I was speaking on one of the workshops and I pointed that out that he said that and uh, some of the administration was embarrassed that he said that. And uh, when I saw the instructor that Monday, you know, he's coming looking at me like, you, you know what, you better, you, you gonna earn your A this time. <laughs> wow. You know, he never said nothing, but I knew from the interaction with him that he saw the art, cause it was actually covered in the Western Courier mm -hmm. that I had uh, mentioned one of the instructors had said that. Yeah, that must have been hard to experience back then. Yeah, it was because you what people don't realize in those situations, there is a lot of stuff when you're the leadership roles. There's a lot of closed door meetings that the average student may not be a part of. And they don't know the things that you do behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of meetings uh, initially uh, with uh, Dr. Wagner, I believe that was his name, who place uh dr leslie malpass as president we had a whole lot of meetings private meetings uh about stuff uh negotiating things i come at one point the sga actually tried to pass something that was going to affect all the black greek organizations where each organization had to have at least i think it was eight members on campus to be active. And a lot of the uh, black uh, fraternities, sororities at times may have three or four members. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Omega Psi Phi, we were fine. We probably had more uh, upward up to 20 members. Yes. But we had a closed door fight about that and they ended up voting against it. But they strongly was trying to get that passed. And, and then I found out it wasn't coming from the SGA uh, members, it was coming from w one of the uh, campus administrators. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so fraternities and sororities on campus play an important part for campus life, especially uh, social service activities, leadership and things of that nature. So it would make sense to have those type of restrictions at a university. But anyway, some of the life lessons that you learned at WIU. If you could sh if you could advise a young Bernard Muhammad, a young 18-year-old Bernard Muhammad, what would you say to him? You, you know, as far as life lessons, you, you know, one of the things I would say, and it's kind of almost, it, it, it almost contradicts some of the stuff I, I had said earlier. I would say trial for the football team. Okay. <laughs> Because um, it was something I wanted to do because I was a pretty good football player uh, coming out of high school. You know, I was a small guy. But when I saw some of those guys play, I, I, I believe I was better than some of those guys I saw playing. And so that's one of the life's lessons is go and do it. Go and try it. Don't think worst thing could happen is you don't actually succeed, but at least you know you put that effort in. Yeah. Because I was recruited by Grambling coming out of high school, but I didn't really know much about HBCUs then. I knew about Howard, but I didn't know about it in the frame of an HBCU. You know, I just knew Howard was a black college, but that was it. And I knew Grambling, you know, Eddie, I was excited that Eddie Robson had sent me a letter, but I wasn't trying to go to Louisiana either. <laughs> it was far away back then, wasn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. So that would be the thing I would say about college students now or no matter where they at in life nothing is worse than not trying something that you really want to do that because we have a regret because you did not attempt it is is uh something that you always keep thinking about what if i had did this and I think that's important. Just just go and try it. <laughs> try it. Put your effort in. And if you if you you do it, then 
kudos to you. If you don't do it, still kudos to you because you tried. Yes, yes. So if you had any opportunity to do redos, possibly change the past if you could, is there anything you would do differently at WIU that you didn't do besides join football no. team? <laughs> That's what I no, you know what? Yeah, when I look think on that question, Byron, there's nothing I would change. Mm-hmm. Byron, my, my experience at Western couldn't be any better, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I matured as a man. Uh, I ended up being a better person. I ended up, the leadership qualities came out that I had. I met some great people there. It, it's nothing that I would change as far as that experience. Uh, prior to that, I would say apply for some more colleges, you know, but that's that comes from being prepared. You know, when you come maybe from a background where just getting a high school diploma is good enough, then, the, you know, sometimes you don't have those aspirations. And in my family, you know, my mother, uh, I think she never made it out the ninth grade and she was a single mother. So her goal was just to get us out of high school. So other than that life lesson is, is apply to universities. And if you need additional advanced education, go on, try it, get it, get it right away. Because that's one of the things I did stall on. I wanted to get my MBA and Dr. Wolman, that was one of the conversations, that conversation we did have was he wanted me to come back to Western and they was gonna, they was um, doing this program to try to get us all the way through to our PhD. And I want to say Chris Washington, Dr. Chris Washington, he ended up using that program, I do believe. Chris is one of the alphas at Western. And Chris was actually the uh, one of the vice presidents on my on my team at the time. I mean, our team was very diverse. Uh, 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 Chris was on it, who was an alpha. Emerson Bowie, who's actually over the FBI in Chicago, he was my first vice president. Uh, there was another alpha, it was a couple of alpha sweethearts, a couple of, I think it was a Zeta on our staff, a couple of just regular people. We had, we had a, we had a full staff. I think we had almost 20 people. Um, Michelle Burr, who's married to McKinley Burr, my frat brother, she was, I believe she was our uh, secretary or finance person or something. And Mia, like I mentioned, she was actually our editor. All right. So, uh, Menard, last question. Is there any okay. last comments for our viewers? I know uh, you got some certificates on the uh, wall. I did want you to mention what type of certificates and awards that those are you have back there on display. In addition, if you can mention the scholarships, uh, how uh, individuals could apply for the Roy Shepherd Scholarship, the Epsilon Beta Memorial Scholarships, and also the uh, Epsilon Beta Foundation Scholarship as well. Okay, let me mention the scholarships first. Right now, the Epsilon Beta Scholarship, we, we raise these funds ourselves. We don't have any big donors. So the Epsilon Beta, for those who golf, we actually have an, a Juneteenth weekend this year where we are uh, raising money for the Epsilon Beta Memorial, I mean, Epsilon Beta Foundation Scholarship. We have a comedy show on Friday, a golf outing on uh, Saturday. That deadline was May 10th. That particular scholarship is for graduating high school seniors. The Epsilon Beta Memorial Scholarship is actually for students who attend Western Illinois that are uh, African-American students that had to have at least 60 hours. That is on their website. Because what we did was we set up, initially we gave out scholarship directly to the students. And then what we uh, did was sat down with uh, I, I don't know why I can't think of the Janice, Janice Owens, Dr. Janice Owens, and we had a endowment set up. So we don't really necessarily have to raise funds anymore for that. Then also the Roy Shepard Scholarship is for black students at Western Illinois who at least have 60 hours or more with a 2.5 grade point average, uh, average or better. And also some of these awards, Byron, it's a lot of different ones. Uh, this one right here, I hope y'all, I know y'all can't see it close up on it. This one right here is where I was selected to who's who among American students at colleges and universities. That was in 19, I believe 87. Then the one over top is a certificate of appreciation from the, actually from Dr. Leslie Malpass in 1986. 
the one underneath it, I was selected to this national organization while I was at Western called Outstanding Young Men of America. That was uh, 1987. This one over here is, uh, I got this student leader of the month in 1986 at Western. Then there's a couple of other things. Some of this other stuff is like more business related and stuff like that. When I was playing high school football, I actually uh, made it to the championship. But it's those things, but those awards are real important. Uh, it's something you could, you know, put them on the wall, show your children. And it's things that, you know, maybe they're considered uh, as far as doing and playing that role. Cause I know my daughter, she went to North Carolina A&T, my oldest daughter. And she was part of the, uh, she was a Senator on campus cause they had different roles, but she was a Senator uh, on campus there. Oh, that's nice. I had one other comment, um, Bernard. Mm -hmm. You're an author, credit emergency surgeon. Oh. I, did, <laughs> I, I purchased that book and we need a part two. There's a lot of people out here that need credit help. So uh, you want to talk about that? What uh, motivated you to become an author? And you need to put that on display in the background also. Oh yeah, let me let me bring this up, Byron. I forget all about this book. I know the yeah. light is a little bright on it. But it's a book called Credit Emergency Surgery, Replacing Bad Credit with Good Credit. I actually wrote this book in 2002 or three. This is when I was in the mortgage business. And you know, you work with people and they have credit challenges. And throughout that process, I'm like telling people what they need to do. And after a while, you know, sometimes you help people fix their credit and they want quick fixes or like, no, I don't have no quick fixes. This is the way you do it. And after a while I said, you know what? I'm gonna write, write a book on credit. And at the time it was selling on uh, Amazon and I believe I sold about 3000 copies through Amazon and other distributors because I had reached out to a couple of people who were wholesalers. And, uh, I, you know, this amazing thing that one day I actually went on an interview back around that time and I'm talking to the person in the interview and they had actually, I think I put it on LinkedIn or something. And they said, hey, can you tell us about your book? And I'm at the interview like, what, what book are y'all talking about, <laughs> right? <laughs> I didn't expect that to come out, but I, I said, oh yeah, so the book. But anyway, I need to republish this book because some of the bankruptcy laws, because I got some information on bankruptcy. So some of the bankruptcy laws have changed since I wrote this book. So I have been contemplating revising the book and re, you know putting it back out with the up-to-date information. And actually I had started on another book that I, um, I put on hold for some years. It was a book called, and I got pages rolled on, for it. It's called Being Broke, I'm Not With That. <laughs> I like that. So I need to find the manuscript for that book. Right, right. Okay. Well, any last words, Bernard? You know what? I'd like to thank you for Byron for having me on on your, on this podcast. Because um, a lot of times people who who do things, you know, they get things done. That kind of personalities like I am. Sometimes you can rub people the wrong way at times because I'm the type of person that if you want to get something done. Uh, I'm the person to ask, but if you're just talking about it, don't call me because <laughs> right. uh, I'm going to pressure you to do it. Yeah, uh, because yeah. I, I would say even I, I, I played a role in getting the Gwyneth Brooks Park, and I don't know if it's mentioned much, but mm -hmm. at one point, me and Nate Jones, who's a Sigma for Weston, we actually had started putting together promotions like five dollar holiday. Mm -hmm. uh, drop a dime day. And at that point, it was maybe $1,000 raised for that part. And when Nate and some of the other students efforts and competition with the attorney sorority, at the time, I believe when we stopped with everybody working together, it, it was at $20,000 in a few months. And I know sometimes some of that stuff goes unrecognized because you know everybody contributed but i would say me and nate i had to bring up nate we put a lot of work on that and i know even a lot of the organizations the, the greek organizations all of them probably dropped about two thousand but it took getting somebody to do it first 
Yeah. And I want to say it might have been Omega Psi Phi and the Alphas. It took those two organizations, you know, dropping two thousand dollars to get the other organization to feel like, okay, this could happen. Because that's the thing when you know when you got a fifty thousand dollar goal and you only have one thousand, that doesn't look like it's attainable. No, but no. once you get the ball rolling, once we got to twenty, like twenty twenty two, wherever it was at. That made it where I had to give credit to our alumni from Western, Kim uh, Lifert, state's attorney. She worked, I believe, and got the rest of the funds to for us to do that project. And even though the Black House that we used to call is gone, there is a site for Black students now where they could congregate and just have a good time. Whatever they may want to do, I mean, it's a, it's a park out there with Gwendolyn Brooks' name on it in a seating area, whatever they like to do. And it's, I would like for one day for us to make sure that those students understand the history of that black house yes. that was on campus. And what I understand, it was it was where a lot of the black students in the 40s lived at. It initially was a resident that they lived at before it became a administration building. Oh, yeah, that's some good history, Madonna. I want to thank, thank you. You, you, thank you. One wonderful participant. Great podcast. Got a lot of information from you. Uh, you, are, you are a Levinet, Levinet legend. That's what I'm going to call you. <laughs> Levinet legend. This is the Levinet legend podcast series. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I appreciate that. Uh -huh. Hey, just a whole lot of peace and love to all the Levinets out there. Yes. Have a good day, Bernard. Thank you. All right. Thank you.